Hi, I'm Vince Stevie, and welcome to MyCrel TV. I'm an FAE here at MyCrel, and today we're going to talk a little bit about Ethernet. We're going to talk about the layers of Ethernet, layer one and layer two, and how they fit into an Ethernet design. A lot of times we come across engineers who have never done an Ethernet design before, and so we need to first explain how Ethernet fits in, how software fits in, and those other things you're going to need to know in your design. I think you'll find this pretty helpful. Let's take a look here at the seven layer OSI model. This is something that's often taught in college and people look at this sometimes and don't really know how to take it in. But what it's all about is layer one and layer two are the parts that we're gonna talk about today. These are the parts that actually drive the copper wires. These are the physical layers and the data link layers. The other layers in this are a lot of software like the layer three, layer four, and on up to layer seven. You can think of something like layer 7. Layer 7 would be more like Windows XP or it would be your Windows 7 or operating system, maybe Linux. The layers down below this are actually layers that are TCP IP stacks and other software. Let's look at this in terms of RS-232. On RS-232 you'll have a microcontroller a lot of times and this microcontroller talks over an 8-bit interface to a UART. The UART is responsible for taking digital data that's parallel words and turning it into serial. Once it's serialized, it sends it out over a physical layer driver, a layer one driver. Those layer one drivers are like MAX 232 devices and it goes out your DB9 connector. The same thing happens if you talk about Ethernet, but we don't call them the same type of devices. The layer one device in this case is an Ethernet Phi. Phi stands for physical layer. The layer two device, or the data link layer that converts all the data back into a digital 16-bit word or whatever the processor wants to read, is called the MAC, and it's a media access controller. So realize here that the layer one is driving the copper wire. When you look at other layers of other communication systems, you'll find the same thing. With USB, there's a USB transceiver and a USB controller. For things called POTS, which is plain old telephone systems, people call out the layer two as a slack. Layer one is a slick. This drives your wires in your house to do tip and ring. Um, you can see the other ones listed down here below, but they're layer one and layer two. The important thing to remember here is that there's always a layer one and layer two. These are the things that you'll do with chips. They're uh, FIs. Max 232s, those kind of things. Layer 1 stuff drives copper wires. Layer 2 reassembles it and puts it into a format that the uh, processor can then communicate with. Everything above that is pretty much software. Next we're going to go into what's required to interface a PHY to a MAC. This is uh, an interface that's a common interface defined by the IEEE 802.3 committee and it's called Media Independent Interface. We abbreviate that to be just MII. The MII interface is a 4-bit wide data path with a transmit clock and a receive clock that runs at 25 megahertz. So 4 bits times 25 megahertz, that's your 100 megabits. And this interface can work at 10 or 100 megabit operation to uh, support legacy devices back to 10 megabits. All in all, it takes up 16 signal lines to interface anybody's PHY to anybody's MAC. The other interface we'll talk about here is the RMII. It's a reduced media independent interface. This one is two bits wide with a single 50 megahertz clock. This path ends up being an eight bit wide interface. Now let's talk about gigabit ethernet. In gigabit ethernet, the interface gets quite a bit wider. Uh, the GMII interface, which is Gigabit Media Independent Interface, is 8 bits of transmit, 8 bits of receive, a transmit clock and a receive clock. So you can see this starts to get pretty heavy. All of a sudden we're up to 24 signals to hook a Gigabit Phi to a Gigabit Mac. There's another Gigabit interface called RGMII, Reduced Gigabit Media Independent Interface. This is 4 bits transmit, 4 bits receive, and still has two clocks. Something to note here is that when you do use RGMII, there are some pad skew registers. Now these pad skew registers are available on the Mac, and they're also available on the Phi. 
They're necessary so you can adjust the timing relationship between each of the RGMII signals and how they work with the Mac and Phi. We're now going to take a look at Micrell's product offering when it comes to Ethernet Phi's. Micrell makes 10100 Phi's and we also make Gigabit Phi's. If you look at our 10100 offering of Phi's, we still offer parts we released back in 2002, such as the KSZ8721. The big difference that came into being going from the 8051s to the 8081s and 8091s is a die shrink and a power reduction. Starting with the 8051, 3121 family, we've sucked all the termination resistors into the parts. Prior to these parts, you required termination resistors that could use as much as 175 milliwatts of power. The 175 milliwatts combined with the 180 milliwatts of power that our parts used to drive the signals came out to a significant number. Now with internal termination, our parts only consume 120 milliwatts total. The new 8081 and 8091 actually consume much less than this. We've also introduced flexible VDDIO allows you to have an MII interface that can operate at 1.8, 2.5, or 3.3, and this eliminates translators. Our parts work above 7 kV human body model. They are the lowest power in the industry and in the smallest package. Also of note is the gigabit parts. Just this year we released the 9031. It's a pin for pin compatible back to our 9021. This is 485 milliwatts total and is a die shrink of the prior 9021. Flexible VDDIO. Thank you for taking the time to view the video today. We hope it helps. From MicroLTV, I'm Vince Stevie.